Well, hello everybody and welcome to this month's RSA webinar. My name is Dr. Meredith Doig. I'm president of the Rationalist Society, which is Australia's oldest free thought group. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to join with us in acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connections to land and sea and community. So tonight, um, it's a real pleasure to have with us Dr. Jennifer Beasley to speak about how religious instruction, uh, otherwise known as SRI or SRE or scripture, um, actually undermines public education. Well, maybe education per se, we will find out. Jennifer is a senior lecturer in the School of Education, Culture and Society at Monash University. And uh, uh, having previously been a secondary school teacher in both um, independent schools and in government schools in Victoria. Her research interests include the religion uh, in public schools, the philosophy of education and philosophy for children, uh, and moral education, and climate change education. She's the author of the book Social Reconstruction Learning, and her papers have appeared in scholarly journals such as Policy Futures in Education, the Oxford Review of Education, the Journal of Curriculum Studies, and Educational Philosophy and Theory. And I'm proud to say that the topic that Jennifer will be speaking to us about tonight was partially supported by the RSA because she was one of the very first recipients of the RSA Patrons Grant. Now, Jennifer will speak to us for about 20 minutes. And as usual, um, we'll then move into uh, questions and answers that we do have some questions that have already been sent in. And I encourage you all to use the chat box if you have a question, if something, a question or a comment occurs to you as Jennifer is going through her presentation, please feel free to type that into the chat box and we'll get through as many of those questions as possible. I do like to try to wrap this up at 8.30, respecting that everybody's time is really precious. And uh, so we'll let you go at 8.30. But do be aware that we do record these sessions and after a day or so, they'll be on the RSA's uh, YouTube channel. And we will send out a link to that channel to everybody who has registered. Um, okay, uh, I think that's about it. So Jennifer, can I invite you please to present to us on how religious instruction undermines education, the goals of education? I'm just sharing my screen. So hopefully you can all see that presentation. Okay, and I'll try and get quick since I only have 20 minutes. Okay, so I'm just going to first give an overview of um, the current, so I use RI, right, that's religious instruction, laws and policies in Australia, which is somewhat complicated because all the states and territories have different uh, laws and policies. There's no federal laws that regulate this. Um, and then I'm going to look at just one part of my project, focusing mm -hmm. on one critique of it, looking at the, the issue of indoctrination. Okay, so... Um, all states and territories in Australia currently allow religious instruction in some form. So this uh, religious instruction is not taught by school teachers. It's taught by representatives from religious organisations who come into the schools and they instruct students in just one particular religious viewpoint. So they're not teaching uh, diverse um, religions. It's not comparative religion. Okay. Uh, class is not compulsory. And it's much more common in primary schools, partly because they're not compulsory. So by secondary school, a lot of students just say, I'm not doing that. Whereas in primary school, parents are probably more likely to be signing kids up for it. Um, and typically the classes run for around 30 to 60 minutes each week. But this differs from state, depending on the state or territory, they usually have rules around how long it can run for each week. Um, sometimes they stipulate like I think Western Australia says no more than 40 hours a year. So sometimes it's a, a yearly amount. Most state or territories are not required to offer religious instruction. So they can offer it, but they're not, it's not mandated. 
The exceptions are in New South Wales, where schools are required to set aside time for religious instruction. They must make some time in the school day for these classes to run. And in Queensland, if some uh, instructors who are authorised uh, show up at the school and want to run the classes, the principal has to let them in to run it. And usually they can run during regular class time. And the only exception to that is Victoria, which back in 2015, as a result of lots of controversy, amended the policy and we're the only state where classes are not allowed to run during our regular class time. They can only run in the hour before or after school or um, during lunchtime. And just show you a little. Uh, this change in Victoria contributed to the classes. Uh, they almost don't, don't run here much at all now, as well as the fact that um, prior to that, uh, Prior to this, schools in Victoria were told um, that they had to run the classes, even though the Education Act didn't say that. It said schools may run it, but the Department of Education told them they had to. And once it became clear that schools didn't have to run it, a lot of them just stopped. And so it gradually declined. And then 2015, they brought in this policy that it could only run outside class time. And you might have seen reported in the age a few weeks ago a story saying that this led to a 99% drop in the numbers of students doing it in Victoria, down from 93,000. Very um, effective. Jennifer, yeah. could I just add, as, as there's a number of people on the uh, webinar at the moment who were involved in that campaign, as, yeah. as the rationalists were, um, but what was really interesting is that that change to moving SRI to outside of class hours was under a Liberal Education Minister. Okay, yeah. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and they do. I think they might, the laws and the policies change a lot. That's the other reason it's hard to write about. And they often change when there's a change in government. Mm. But and sometimes, like in New South Wales, both Labor and Liberal governments, um, both Labor and Liber Liberals support it. So it differs. Even the political views differ from one state to another. Yeah. Okay. So as a result, most of the controversy is in Queensland and New South Wales right, because that's where it's most commonly taught and that's where schools are required to teach it. And uh, before that change in Victoria, there was a lot of controversy here too where schools were told they had to teach it. You don't hear too much in other states or territories because it's not mandated, it doesn't run too much. Uh, someone did ask specifically about South Australia, which is an interesting um, case because they changed the, it looks like the Education Act and the regulations that go under it changed in about 20, 2020 during COVID. Um, and certainly it can run in South Australia. It used to be a restriction that you could only have four half-day seminars a year, so one per term was usually how it ran, and it's called religious activities, it's different names in every state and territory, but um, it, they changed it, and from what I can see currently, I cannot find any actual restrictions on the time limits in South Australia. It's also um, opt-out, so... Um, unless parents write to say they don't want their kids to attend, they will be put into it. So they don't need to give explicit mm. consent. That's very unusual. If, South, if that's correct, and I can't find any time restrictions in South Australia, they'd be the only state or territory that doesn't have clear limits on how often it can run. Could just be that I can't see it in the new policies and that. But um, every other state or territory has um, some restriction on how on how much um, RI you can have. Okay, so I'll quickly... Okay, this is a sort of part of my research project that I've been working on, which is explaining why RI is indoctrination and why that's a problem. Now, some people may think it's obviously it is, <laughs> um, but one problem is yes. people say that. And then say, everyone just says it's indoctrination, but where's the evidence or what does that mean? Mm, or what so does indoctrination I, actually mean? What does it when mean? talk about indoctrination, <laughs> what's the definition? What's the definition? Mm. Okay, so I wanted to explore that and look at what was the evidence that, that it is indoctrination. So I'm going to use this quite well-known um, definition given by Ivan Snook, who's a New Zealand philosopher of education. It's pretty old. It's from 1970. And it's a person indoctrinates pupils with certain propositions if they teach with the intention that the pupil or pupils will believe these propositions regardless of the evidence. So you teach with the intent that the students will believe what you're telling them regardless of the evidence for it. Okay. Now, some people say, well, that's not my intent, so therefore I'm not an indoctrinator. But, of course, nobody who's trying to indoctrinate would admit to it, so we can draw an inference. 
And what Snook said is we can look at how the content they teach and the methods they're using, and we can draw an inference from that about whether they're like whether we think they're likely to be indoctrinating, regardless of whether they admit it or not. So what sort of content is often associated with indoctrination? Someone who's trying to teach false beliefs, someone who's trying to persuade students about of beliefs that are not well supported by evidence, or beliefs that are um, epistemically controversial. That means where there's no evidence or reasons to clearly support one view or the other. It doesn't just mean socially controversial. So we don't think that, you know, um, climate, climate science is controversial just because some people deny it because all the evidence says that, it, that that's correct. So it's got to be where there's a legitimate, you know, controversy about where there's no clear evidence either way. Okay. But also it isn't just teaching that sort of content, it's you teaching that content in a particular sort of way. So you've got to have the content and the methods. Indoctrinators tend to resort to non-rational methods because when you're trying to teach, you're trying to persuade somebody to adopt beliefs that, for which there's no good evidence for them, you can't persuade them using reasons and evidence because it doesn't, doesn't exist or it doesn't support your case. So you're going to resort to non-rational methods. And this is just some of the examples of the sorts of teaching methods associated with um, indoctrination. So the first one is emotional indoctrination. You try to persuade somebody to adopt certain beliefs using things like fear, threats, punishment, e.g. if you don't believe this, you'll go to hell, intimidation, or it can be uh, positive stuff like rewards or inducements, like giving out treats and lollies and so on. Peer pressure, being loved, being accepted, feeling part of a community if you accept these beliefs mm. and go along with it. Whereas Hillsong does love bombing. Yes, yes, I've got it on here. Mm. I saw that. <laughs> it was a lovely, um, I think, it's way to describe it, love bombing. Yep. Repetition, rituals, reciting, drill and rote. Uh, deception, misrepresenting contro controversial beliefs as if they're facts or admitting counter arguments, doing this on purpose, not by accident. And also use of authority. You should accept this because this special book says so, this authoritative source. Or you should accept this because this person, this teacher who's an authority figure says so, or this important person says so, as opposed to what are the reasons and evidence for it. So it's important to note you've got to sort of, you have to have both. You could, students, I mean, teachers can teach using things like repetition or drill, and it's not indoctrination. So if I have students reciting the times tables, that's not indoctrination. Mm. Their intent isn't to get students to believe something regardless of the evidence. That's why that Snook's definition is important. The intent is just to again and remember something so they can use it's it. It's efficient. It's efficient. That's right. It's just about getting memory. But if I'm getting someone to recite passages of the Bible or passages of the Communist Manifesto or something where there's no good reason to do that and it's not the sort of information that should just be accepted and put into memory, mm -hmm. um, if you see someone doing that, then you should be worried about what we should be thinking. The likely intent here is to indoctrinate. To get them to accept so an, an ideology, Jennifer. Would you summarize trying to teach an ideology? Is that associated with indoctrination? If you try to teach um, an ideology or a, do a doctrine that's controversial, hmm. could be disputed, and you try to teach it in any of those ways, that's indoctrination. Mm -hmm. So even if it's content we agree with, so even if someone did try to get someone to accept climate science using fear, like we're mm -hmm. all going to die. And that was what they relied on. That would still be indoctrination. There's right. just no reason to do that because there's plenty of evidence for them to use. So it would be strange. But it, yeah, it's neither the content or just the methods. It's the combination of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why do we think what evidence is there then that RI involves indoctrination? So by definition, RI involves the teaching of controversial content or content not well supported by the evidence. Um, and I say it by definition because, well, an uh, easy way to define religions to distinguish it from other um, sets of beliefs is that there's a belief, some belief in the supernatural. And clearly the supernatural is something controversial, contentious, and not well supported by the evidence. Um, you can't take that bit out of religious instruction because what would, what would be left and what would distinguish it from other subject areas. So there's a philosopher, English philosopher, Michael Hand, who's also written about this um, and says, for this reason alone, it's, it's indoctrination because you're trying to persuade students 
to accept uh, to adopt beliefs in the supernatural, but that's uh, that's controversial content. You can't teach it like that. Okay. You must be using non-rational methods to persuade students to adopt that. Okay. Uh, other examples are literalist interpretations of scripture. And I'm going to give some examples from some of the little examples I'm giving are from reviews that have been conducted of as a result of the controversies um, of religious instruction materials and religious instruction programs. So this one's from a review that's done on Queensland materials. This is an example from the materials that was considered problematic. The Bible is a book of facts. There is no fiction in it. So um, this review was done in 2020. Uh, an earlier review uh, by the government, which was done in 2016, uh, raised issues about the same sort of content in this same curriculum. And yet in 2020, we still see it um, in that in those materials, even though they're asked to revise them. Um, creationism, which some people tell me, oh, well, that's not a common belief amongst a lot of religious um, organisations anymore. In the, in the materials I'm looking at, it's pretty common. So we see it in a lot of the religious <laughs> instruction materials I'm looking at whether it's a common belief amongst uh, a lot of people of different religions. I don't know. Certainly plenty of people don't who are religious don't adopt creationism. But for whatever reason, it's common within these religious instruction materials. Not all of them, but in quite a lot of them. So mm -hmm. creationism is clear, clearly not well supported by the evidence. This is an example from a New South Wales review that was done where parents complained um, about fundamentalist views or literal interpretations of scriptures that could be seen as anti-science, like teaching creationism or that dinosaurs never existed. So a little example up there from our own analysis that we're currently doing. Um, these are learning objectives in the um, teaching materials. Uh, our aim is to help students understand that the Bible is historically reliable. And then to show students that the Bible teaches that the world was created by God and is maintained by him. Um, the second bit tries to say, well, the Bible says this. We're not saying it's a fact. However, the first one says that the Bible's a his historically reliable. So if the Bible's historically reliable and the Bible says this, <laughs> the implication is that it is a fact that it's true. Mm. Okay. And another example is teachings like miracles obviously controversial or not supported by the evidence, people being brought back to life, immaculate conception, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and we see that's lots of lots of examples of that in different reviews of RI. And it's just some examples from our own um, analysis of materials we're doing. I learned that Jesus was made alive again by God. These are learning objectives. So students will learn again that Jesus, learn that Jesus was made alive again by God. Students will be amazed that Jesus can give life. Um, and students will act out the story of how Jesus healed uh, Bartimaeus of his blindness, things like that. That's a kindergarten curriculum. And, okay. And some of the problematic methods um, that we've seen evidence of in our eyes. So in order to teach that sort of content, you can teach contra uh, controversial content or content that's not well supported by evidence. And as all good teachers know, the way you teach that sort of content is you present it as highly controversial and not supported by the evidence. And you remain impartial. You give students all the information and arguments and evidence on either side and you let them debate it and critique it. But that's not what happens in our eye. First of all, the instructor can't possibly be impartial because they're a representative of the religious organisation. Mm. And from the point of view of the students, they're an authority figure. So there's an issue about... Um, accepting beliefs because there's an authority figure who has a sort of teacher role in the classroom. Um, and clearly we know what that person believes and the aim is that the class, the students there would also adopt these beliefs. So some other examples of problematic methods we see use of deception, which is evident from the content on the last slide. So presenting controversial and non-evidentiary beliefs as if they are facts. Um, and also non-controversial content being presented as if it is controversial. So there's also examples of um, evolutionary theory being presented as if it's controversial when it's accepted, a knowledge taught on the official science curriculum. So it means you've got people going into schools during school, during class time, teaching that evolutionary theory is contested and equal or not equal. <laughs> as an alternative to creationism and presenting those as, you know, 
equally contested, which undermines, um, it's undermining content being taught by qualified science teachers on the science curriculum, which I find extraordinary. Um, Jennifer, we, the RSA has written to uh, the, Victor the New South Wales um, Education Minister about this, and they are just seem to be, um, well, they don't seem to take it very seriously. Yeah. yeah. And it, you know, it, it's, just, it's just too hot a topic, or they think that it's too hot a topic to, uh, to tackle. Yeah. Um, I think it's just political. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's yeah. right. It is political. Yeah. So, yes, it's, it, rather, it's extraordinary. So even if even if they did do a class where they said, I mean, they can't remain neutral again because we know what their position is on the topic. But if they did say, okay, evolutionary theory versus creationism, you decide, let's debate it. Uh, the, they're not qualified to provide an accurate account of evolutionary mm. theory and the evidence for it because you need to be a science teacher. So you shouldn't be doing it anyway. Mm. Um, so it's there's no way in which that can be taught um, in a non-indoctrinary way in this setting. A reliance on pedagogy that supports uncritical rote learning. So the New South Wales Review of Religious Instruction Materials, um, which was conducted in 2015, um, they said the materials used by 86% of the providers, privileged teacher-directed lessons, activities that required low levels of cognitive demand. Um, in a review of Christian RI materials, then used in Victorian schools, um, these were access ministry ones, back before when, when it was widely taught in Victoria. Uh, David Singer found the materials, um, he was a Monash researcher at the time, were based on recall, very basic factual information, little opportunity for students to apply higher order thinking and focus on responding to stimulus to give a correct answer. So this, when we combine that sort of teaching with the content would be an indication of indoctrination. Uh, emotional indoctrination, one of the most common complaints is about the use of fear and scary content and mm. content that is not age appropriate, but um, when it looks like fear is being used to encourage acceptance of beliefs, that looks like indoctrination, especially contentious beliefs. So in the New South Wales Review, parents complained about the use of scare tactics, including students being told that people who don't believe in God would die young, children who would stop going to scripture would go to hell. Research by Cathy Byrne, lots of research on um, RI in Queensland and New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Children told they would burn in hell if they did not believe in Jesus. We see this sort of complaint come up again and again and again. <laughs> uh, sinning, including satisfying desires, will have dire consequences, including death. That was in the, the reviews done by the government in Queensland of religious instruction materials, um, including the other things where babies dying, uh, God creating natural disasters like floods um, to correct wrongs. These are all primary school materials. Rewards and inducements. So this is one thing we're looking at. These are examples we found in our analysis. So I think there's a lot of, a common complaint too in multiple states was about our instructors giving out lollies and treats and stickers mm -hmm. and things like that, which you may think is superficial. Within the context, I think it can also be a form of indoctrination given what they're trying to teach and what, what they're trying to do. Um, but there's a lot of this sort of content we find um, that could be very seductive for young children. Imagine being together with God and Jesus forever with no sadness. Begin to grasp from the Bible that they are deeply loved by Jesus and God. Understand how much Jesus values children. Be encouraged to look forward to God's new heaven and earth. It's kind of reward. It's, you know, if you believe this, you'll be part of this special community. You'll be deeply loved. Um, we also know of concerns about Students feeling peer pressure to go along to RI because all their friends are in that class. Mm -hmm. And so they say, I want to be there. And the kids get stickers and they get this. And so the parents just let them go because they feel like bad. going to McDonald's. <laughs> That's like a happy meal toy. Yeah. Um, and this is what um, Meredith was just referring to. It was a story on the ABC News the other day. And it reminded me of this. So an ex member of the Pentecostal church referred to this as love bombing. Mm. Um, and he said, after joining the church, Brian recalls being enveloped by the sense of community and acceptance. At first, it's come in, open arms. Jesus loves you. Jesus accepts you. There is grace for anything you might have done wrong. You'd be forgiven for anything. It was love bombing, really roping you in through it. Whether it's done unintentionally or intentionally is up for debate. Okay. 
So how does RI undermine key educational aims fostering inquiries? Oops, hurry up, man. Okay, so indoctrination actively undermines the capacity for inquiry. Um, because which is the ability to make decisions for yourself, problem solve, engage in critical and creative thinking, because it's encouraging you to accept, just accept things on blind faith, <laughs> because someone important said so, because some important book said it. So it, it undermines this, it discourages critical thinking and problem solving and thinking for yourself. The famous educational philosopher John Dewey argued that the aim of education was growth, and the way you get growth is through inquiry. You come into conflict with your environment. In order to survive and adapt, we use the process of inquiry to solve problems. It's the most fundamental aim of education. We can't survive without this capacity. Without it, we are people who, who have been indoctrinated. They're easy targets for being controlled and all sorts. It grooms you to be manipulated. Um, and they tend to be dogmatic and uh, not you can't easily change their minds because they never adopted their beliefs through reasoning. Mm. So you can't persuade them <laughs> using reasoning. Okay. So inquiry is a fundamental aim of education. Now, Julia was writing that back in 1916, but that general idea is widely accepted today. It's in all our education policies. So this is the um, Alice Springs Declaration, which sets, sets the goals for all um, learning in Australian schools. Um, it emphasizes the ability, key goal for all Australian students. They'll have the ability to think deeply and logically, obtain and evaluate evidence, solve problems as a key educational goal. Australian curriculum has critical and creative thinking um, and other related ideas, general capability taught through all subject areas, fundamental skill that the curriculum and teachers must foster. And we're looking at um, how RI might undermine efforts to combat post-truth problems. So there's growing cause for educators to help deal with the issues of a post-truth world. So in general, that's the idea that we're now living in a world flooded by disinformation, misinformation, conspiratorial thinking, science denialism, extremism, social division, social alienation, the internet is a key contributor to these issues. And uh, schools need to help combat this, again, by teaching good thinking, fostering, fostering intellectual virtues like um, a love of truth, a commitment to seeking evidence, intellectual carefulness and diligence and courage. Indoctrination undermines all of that because, again, it's encouraging you to uh, accept beliefs regardless of the evidence, to not do any of those things, to not care about the finding the evidence or finding truth. Okay, so just quickly, the, the next part of our project, um, well, what we're working on at the moment is we're going through all different um, religious instruction materials, or at least a selection of them. And we're evaluating them um, by classifying the outcomes, whether they foster inquiry or they're likely to negate it. We're looking at whether they contain content that's an indication of indoctrination, like the use of fear. So here's some examples from our research. Um, we're looking at if they have any content that undermines the official curricula, like the science curricula. And we're looking to see whether they um, contain content that discriminates against or privileges particular groups. Um, which you didn't look at much here, but that's been another complaint as well. There's been complaints that was one in Victoria about um, materials that were homophobic, that discriminated against non-Christians being handed out in RI uh, classes. Okay, so that was quick, and I still think I went over time. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, thank you. Now, um, before we get into uh, the questions that have been um, sent in, I'll just get those up make sure that I've got those. Um, um, I just want, want to, because there are a couple of things that, that uh, occurred to me as you were speaking. So if I could um, take the privileges of chair, do you think the, the religious agencies uh, who develop these curriculum materials do you think that over time, because of the criticisms that have been levelled at some of the materials, are they becoming a little bit more sophisticated in the way that they try to package the materials? Yeah. Yes. So one thing I've noticed is <laughs> I think they actually think they're, they're, some providers think the materials are progressive, not indoctrination. Actually, it's like progressive education. Because they seem to think indoctrination just means 
a teacher standing up there lecturing and being quite scary and forceful with the ideas. Mm -hmm. But the best indoctrination is actually the really, you know, friendly, charming, (laughs) seductive type that's Mm -hmm. much more effective. Mm -hmm. And so in that review done by the Multifaith Network, they keep saying the materials are lovely because they've got really colourful pictures and student activities and the activities like students do role play or they do Mm -hmm. like word find and it's student-centred, therefore it's progressive. But student-centred doesn't mean progressive. Um, If you're doing something like a role play where all you do is reenact some scene from the Bible, um, that's re- that could just that could just be a form of indoctrination if all you're doing is helping you to uncritically accept this viewpoint and making it fun. That's actually even worse than just having someone present that information to you. So making yeah, so I but I think they are changing it to make it sort of student centered mm-hmm. stuff to make it look modern and progressive. But student centered, if the student centered task is just really still reciting and not and uncritically accepting or repeating information even though mm-hmm. the students are doing it that's still a type of indoctrination too but yes I think they're trying to get more sophisticated um but to me it looks just the same problem perhaps even worse yeah so obviously from their point of view they believe that they have the truth yeah so when you talked about Um, the love of truth as being one of the key intellectual virtues, they could probably agree with you, but there's a different interpretation of truth. So do you have a comment about um, how (laughs) sitting in their shoes, thinking that they have the truth, how, how that differs from your definition of truth? Yes. So, I mean, when, when this, the, my paper that was published on this, the first one, the reviewer, I believe, was a, um, religious, one of the reviewers, and they said, well, truth is just, you know, Plato said, it's true justified belief, and I believe this, it's justified and it's true, and that's it, that's it. So that's, you know, so, and I said, but that's not, <laughs> that's not, the Platonic theory is just a very simple three criteria. Each of those criteria then has whole philosophies, like there's whole theories of what justification well, what does it mean to have a belief? So, um, well, we mean, of course, it's not just true because you believe it. Nothing on the school curriculum is just there because someone happens to believe it. If that's the case, why don't we teach all sorts? Why don't we teach flat earthers, views, and all sorts of things? Some people believe it. So, obviously, we mean empirical evidence or um, strong, compelling reasons, hmm. empirical evidence um, that would support this viewpoint. And not things where there's already an abundance of empirical evidence that counters it. There's mm. plenty of uh, there's evidence and arguments that are better, mm. support the opposing view better than the view that you're holding. Um, of course, I can't convince somebody who just thinks, I can't persuade them of that. I'm just trying to say what should be on the school curriculum and what shouldn't be. And the point is we don't allow other stuff like this on the school curriculum. Saying it's not the curriculum and it's extracurricular and it's being taught by people who aren't teachers doesn't make it any better because from the point of view of the students in the classroom they don't understand that like if you're a seven-year-old you're not in the class going well this isn't the real teacher and this isn't the department of education curriculum so I don't have to Mm. take it seriously they don't know that it's running in class during the school day the person behaves like a teacher um so so they have the authority that they are an authority figure they're an authority figure they're a teacher figure to that student Mm. and no teachers would be allowed to do this for good reason. And I don't Jennifer, know why, why it's allowed. Why do allowed. we know? Do we have any evidence or data to um, give us an indication of how effective these teachers, these instructors, because they're actually not teachers, they're instructors. That's why it's indoctrination. Well, that's why instructor is a better term than teacher for this material because they are instructing in a particular doctrine, hence indoctrination. But do we have any evidence to say whether or not um, these instructors are actually effective in convincing the, the children that what they're instructing them in is true, correct, and something that they should believe in? Not that I not that I know of. 
and one of the more amusing with Michael Hans paper where he said you know this is all indoctrination because you're persuading people of controversial beliefs one one that led to a series of other papers responding to it and there was a back and forth argument in this journal that it was published in what one of the critics responses was well it's probably not very effective anyway it probably doesn't work on most students so it doesn't matter which Michael Hans said that's a that's appalling <laughs> even if it's not effective why would you allow people to do some try and do something that's harmful mm. it doesn't matter if it's effective or not. so I, w- I don't know of any research which says whether it's effective or not I suspect on a lot of people indoctrination isn't at all effective however when we're talking about six seven eight nine year olds Mm. I think there's a very good chance it would be I think I think it's likely to be quite successful although I think many of them will get older and then start to question it especially Mm. if they're exposed to alternative um, viewpoints Um, but even if it is ineffective I don't know why would we, we why would we would allow something that's not educational that's potentially harmful and presumably if they're in a school environment that um, that reinforces the doctrinaire beliefs, it, they're more likely to take it up compared with a, uh, a government school where they may have other teachers who teach to evidence and so on. I've just asked Alison Cordes to unmute. Alison is the spokesperson or one of the spokespersons for Queensland Parents for Secular State Schools. And I wondered whether, Alison, you might welcome, um, just update us about uh, what's happening in Queensland about scripture classes. Mm, Thank you, Meredith. And uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Your research is um, very, very interesting and I think helpful in the overall discussion about religious instruction, particularly, as you said, in the states that have to have it where a provider comes along and wishes to to offer it at schools, being New South Wales and Queensland. Um, I just want to say at the outset that Queensland Parents for Secular State Schools, we're just a volunteer um, parent group. Our position is that we absolutely respect the right of parents to raise their children in their family faith if they have one and, you know, we have no issue with them taking them to Sunday school or a temple or a mosque to assist with that faith formation. So our position is just in relation to state schools, uh, which we believe should be secular, as in the separation of church and state. So that if religion is going to be in state schools, it should only be as an academic subject of comparative religion taught by teachers as part of a department approved curriculum. Now, of course, that's not at all what RI is, as as Jennifer has, has described. So we formed nearly 10 years ago. Um, when our children uh, were young and there was RI happening in our schools and and we had concerns about it. Um, So we've been doing this for a long time and I never thought we'd still be doing it 10 years later, but every day we actually just feel more energised and passionate that we're closer to a time when there's going to be a, a big change in RI, hopefully to have it removed completely from the Education Act, which needs law change. Um, when Victoria actually moved moved RI um, out of school hours, there actually was hardly any happening because principals were allowed to say, no, we don't want it. But in Queensland, uh, we can't do that. And the um, Department of Education um, won't allow it to be done in break time, which it could under the law because the religious instruction providers uh, lobby against that because they know that if they have to compete with children going on a break and having a run around the school oval or listening to RI that they're probably not going to choose RI (laughs) so and I get and I get it I get from their point of view what they're trying to to do and that they want as many children available to to um you know be in their in their lesson with of course parent parent permission so we've done a lot of work around informed consent and getting schools to comply with with policies as as well as you know lobbying over the years for at least a proper review into ri the last time a proper government one was done was actually in 1972 and um it was done under a, a 
what we'd call a parliamentary committee now, but, but they didn't have them back then. It was very thorough and it actually was scathing of our eyes. So back in 1972, they said that you know, we live in a global world. We shouldn't have, um, you know, children um, uh, being separated in their state schools by, by religious instruction. We should be educating them all together so that they're better global citizens uh, and that school state schools should be places of education not evangelism so you know when when we so what we, happened 1972 1972 so this this was the report that was issued um and joe biogi peterson our infamous premier was actually premier at the time he was a an evangelical christian and we don't think he was too pleased with the outcome of that report because he ordered it hidden for 30 years <laughs> So after 30 years, it automatically uh, ended up in the Queensland State Library archives and, and I stumbled across it and um, showed it to our education minister who'd never heard of it. So they didn't know that it existed. And there has, there's been some tinkering with the Education Act ever since, but never a review to look at should our eyes still be in state schools. So where what's that, 50 years um, overdue for another one. And, and look, it could have all been addressed 50 years ago if that report hadn't been hidden and they'd acted to actually remove it. So we've been getting a lot of publicity uh, lately. You know, publicity ebbs and flows. You never know, you know, what's going to take journalists' fancies from time to time, but we have been getting good publicity and particularly in relation to um, a sermon by a Brisbane church called uh, City Point Church. And the, um, there was an RI volunteer that um, was introduced um, during the, the church sermon to talk about RI to try and um, seek some uh, volunteers to come and help with her efforts to provide RI in state schools. And she's a very enthusiastic lady and she, she's just amazed at how this opportunity um, to go into schools is like having a uh, Sunday school in the school classroom. She talks about how that state school kids are mission fields and that we it's amazing how the government just lets us go in there. And um, she talks about harvesting um, and discipling children and is particularly... It's, ama it's amazing what people might say when they don't think somebody's watching them. Ex exactly. And parents are certainly not, um, not told that. Mm. Um, if you're interested, have a look at... Um, our latest post on our Queensland Parents for Secular State Schools Facebook page because we wrote what an honest, informed consent uh, for parents would look like um, mm -hmm. with all these sorts of things in it and many of them being actual quotes that we've found from our religious instruction providers. So, yeah, please check, please check that out. So the thing is, though, is that there's nothing the government can do about, you know, that sermon or those claims in there because they're not doing anything wrong by saying those things. They, you know, it, RI is like having Sunday school and a church in a classroom. Um, you know, they are allowed to, to um, think whatever they like about their reasons for going in and what their expectations are, are in return. Um, the problem is not with the 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 churches and 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 how they view schools it the problem is with the law that lets them in mm. so um that's what we need to be addressed we need to get the law changed and where we've now got um labor government politicians speaking up personally on their social media um, slamming RI. So that's the first time that we've openly seen that. We know from personal conversations with lots of MPs that they're not in favour of RI. But as it's already been said tonight, it's political. Yep. Um, and uh, we've also recently um, done a cartoon. Um, we did one years ago of a, of a, um, a tank with religious instruction um, written on it, barreling into a state school classroom and knocking aside chairs and the teacher looking horrified in front of the blackboard, um, basically saying, you know, religious instruction has been commandeering state school classrooms for 100 years. And so we recently did a new one and it's also on our Facebook page. We'd love you to have a look at it. So it's a picture of an apple tree. There's there's um, apples right at the top. There's big barrels of apples at the bottom of the tree that have already been picked and those barrels of apples are labelled voluntary assisted dying, LGBTIQ and 
um, abortion and and those barrels are all full of apples that have been picked off the tree and we've got two characters in the cartoon one is uh, Grace Grace our education minister and the other our premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and there's a lovely big right low-hanging apple with R.I. on it and Grace low-hanging fruit low-hanging fruit and um you know grace is saying oh we can't touch that one we might upset the religious folk and the premier is saying yep she's eating it casually eating an apple surrounded by all these barrels of apples that they've already picked on really hot potato religious yes. items um, allison we need to move on because okay we, so we yeah so check, so check that out so you know we we're battling we're battling on and um and we we believe in this really strongly and we will continue to out to fight to get law the law changed and anybody who's watching um the best way to get in touch with you and your group Alison is via Facebook your Facebook group yes so you can send us a message and we'll respond so right. thank so you Queensland parents for secular state schools look it, it up on Facebook and particularly if you are living in Queensland, particularly if you're a parent who's worried about what's going on uh, for your children, um, please reach out to Alison because they're on a bit of a roll. And we here in the RSA are trying to support um, in any way that we can. I just want to, there's a few questions that um, have been sent in beforehand. Um, and there's one from Mark Williams. I don't think Mark is on the call, so I'm going to read it out. Mark Williams says, is scientific education at religious schools, whether private and government funded um, religious schools, of generally a higher or lower or on a par quality with, with just government funded schools? Can there be a reasonable comparison made? So he's asking about scientific education but in in independent and catholic schools compared to government schools jennifer do you have any comment about that well i don't know if there's any um like research showing whether one's better or the other because it's difficult to get approval to do research where you compare independent schools to government schools right. it's it usually isn't given ethics approval <laughs> um the Department of Education, as far as I know. So I don't know if there's any research that would look at that. It would be interesting. Um, my guess is probably it would depend a lot on the independent school because there's so much um, diversity. So I'm independent. I taught in a religious school and it was progressive and did not teach content like you see in these RI classes, which is in interesting. Uh, certainly didn't teach creationism and um taught evolutionary theory mm. and even in that school I had it was a Christian school and I had Buddhist guest speakers come in for classes and things like that and it was all yeah it's interesting isn't it that some of the diversity. religious schools are quite progressive and teach a sort of a form of general religious education yeah a lot of the people that were teaching religious education in that school um well, most of the staff were not actually religious a lot of the students weren't, most of the students probably weren't religious. I remember being on an excursion with some students and a lady said to them, what religion is your school? And they said, I don't know, Catholic? It was not Catholic. <laughs> so that showed you how much they cared. It was just an elite school and that's why yeah. most of the people went there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of people teaching religion at school were not actually religious. So it was more, it was actually often taught more like general religious comparative or at least fairly open. But, you know, left, left. Now, I've, uh, there's a question from David Cohen, and David, if you're watching us, I was trying, I was getting asking you to unmute so you could ask your own question. So, um, I think you had two questions. Um, would you like to ask your question in the chat box, please? Uh, one of the ones I put up at the time, uh, they're talking about uh, parents' right to teach children whatever they want about their own religion. And I disagree with that because some parents are teaching very dangerous things. I understand that may be politically um, necessary policy of a, a general group to have, and maybe we just maybe it's not necessary to worry about the the occasional crap pot in, in terms of your group. But I was just I was upset by that. Mm. Um, was there another question you were asking about? Yeah. Clearly. Clearly there's limitations on it, right? The right to raise, we, those religious rights have limitations on the right to raise your children in your own religion. But there's 
it's clear it can't be abuse, it can't be. Unfortunately. <laughs> and people get in trouble for doing stuff, you know, raising their children in the religion and it results in the kids being seriously harmed. So you can't get in trouble for it. The issue is, of course, it's harder to, harder to police. To find. Mm, in school, that's but, right. Yeah. So you're right. You're right, David, of course. There's, there's got to be, it's not an unlimited right to do whatever you want with your kids because of your religion. I, mean, I, would, I would classify, you know, things like the... um. But the exclusive brethren and you know known known religions that, are, that are known practices and they 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 do get away with it. So I mean I think it's just a disgrace, but mm. just back to my spleen. I mean we're we're not an atheist group. We are a secular group. So you know when we you know when I was talking about we respect parents' rights to raise their faith, obviously that's subject to those um to those limits. So yes. Um, I, I just for those of you who are joining us from South Australia, in the chat box, um, Stella Thomas has suggested that anybody in South Australia who would also reach out to her um, through the RSA, she's on our board, uh, because I know Stella has done a lot of work in the past when her children were at school in trying to counter the religious instruction such as it such as it is in South Australia, it's clearly not as big a problem as it is in other states. But Stella, um, you're still happy to connect with anybody? Um, yeah, I've just got, uh, we don't have a big group here, but we do, I'm in connection with um, Alison and um, Ferris and Victorians. And so we, we're in a general private chat. So we're sort of across on other states. But when it comes to SA, myself and another gentleman, Mark, um, we sort of try and keep abreast of things. I haven't been as active lately, but I, I did do a submission last week, so I'm always up for a chat with anyone in SA that wants to, you know, join in on a letter or ask what's going on or contribute because we don't have a big movement. I think that's because we don't have a big problem, but it's still there. They still come in in different ways and we still have pat chaplaincy issues, which is another whole story, hmm. um, so I won't take too much time. Okay. Um, Michael Dove has a question. Michael, would you like to unmute and ask your question? You did send it in beforehand. I can remind you of it if you don't have it immediately to hand. Uh, thanks, Meredith. Uh, you might be able to paraphrase it better than I did. I can't remember what I wrote. Okay. But I think it was something along the lines of why is the focus really on, on state schools um, rather than government uh rather than non-government schools uh, including so if course, indoctrination is a problem anyway isn't mm -hmm. it a problem in non-state schools just as much as in government schools yeah is that jennifer yes probably in, i would think so in some of them the michael hand uh, article that i keep referring to where he says all this sort of religious instruction is indoctrination it's a well-cited paper he's not talking about public schools he, the paper is titled An Argument for the Abolition of Faith Schools, and it's quite well known in England. And in England, that there's a the debate is focused on, amongst philosophers, the abolition of faith schools, and there are people um, who argue for that over there. And of course, uh, the issue is, yes, if it could be shown, he, his argument is that all the religious education in faith schools is of the same nature. It's the same as religious instruction. It involves indoctrination because you're trying to persuade students using non-rational methods to adopt beliefs regardless of the evidence. He's saying by definition that's what it involves. Um, uh, generally, I'm just focused on state schools because we've still got it in state schools here, and I'm like, if we can't get it out of state schools, <laughs> mm. we first got to tackle that. What, what hope do we have there? And at least in <laughs> most state schools, their education acts say that education should be secular. Should be secular, that's right. So. Mm. Um, whereas obviously that's not the case for the independent schools. But it does depend, like I said, I, I taught in, in a religious school. It was pretty progressive and I, I, I didn't find the, the sort of issues really as what um, <laughs> I didn't, the stuff that is in these religious instruction materials, I didn't see much of that in the school I was teaching. So it would depend a lot, I guess, on this, like I said, there's a huge variation in religious schools. But, yeah, there certainly is an argument. You could be right. There's a good argument for saying um, this applies to all faith schools too. Why do they, why should they exist? Why should they get taxpayer money um, mm. as well? Yeah, so the, question. the question as much as anything, the question as much as anything is really about 
um, you know, state funding and whether schools should be state funding that are including this sort of indoctrination in their curriculum. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, state has a responsibility to monitor the appropriate allocation of its funding. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, we're almost coming to the end of our time together, but Les Allen had uh, an interesting question. Les? Uh, thanks. Yes, you were making me reflect on whether the techniques you were talking about, the RI techniques, teaching techniques, um, had some similarities to the grooming of children. I'm thinking about the power imbalance, the focusing of a lot of attention, love uh, on, on children. Has anyone made that comment or done any kind of research or analysis on that and whether it's a form of grooming? I don't know, but I often use the term grooming to describe it. Do you? It. Yeah. yeah. I used it in the presentation. I think it sounds like grooming to me. I had to laugh at one, one example of it. I heard of the, cha the chaplains who were running lunchtime activities in the school and um, getting any, any kids could go along to the activities run by the chaplain. And the chaplain was doing all this sort of fun stuff with the kids. I don't know if there was much religious stuff was going on, but one of the things they said, the, the girls were all getting their hair braided, female chap, or getting their hair, hair braided. And I said, oh, lit literal grooming. And <laughs> because, of course, it makes it all, like I was saying, oh, it's good fun and the kids love it. And then some little hints about on, on Sundays we run this group you know it's that kind of yes befriending mm. and being charming that sort of emotional indoctrination mm. you know be being friends with the students building a special relationship this little fun sense of community and then the sort of mm. come and then come along to this and join this and believe this and so on yes I think the, the point uh, Liz um correct me if I'm wrong but it's about the use of terminology and grooming has a very negative mm. uh, uh, connotation associated with it. And people, there's, we need to find ways to raise the awareness of the general public, but parents in particular, about what is going on. Because generally, they're just not aware of it. I mean, some parents, like the like Allison's of the world and the Stellas of the world, they're aware, are outraged, and are trying to do something about it. But generally speaking, the majority of parents are not aware. They they sort of trust that because it's, you know, religion's supposed to be vaguely a good thing, so it couldn't be doing too much harm. Or they see it as being a bit of a, having a bit of a monopoly on introducing values, and it's certainly not that. Ah, uh, Yes. You know, oh, it's just a bit of harmless values. I got through it as a kid. It's fine. And it's it's not that. And they sort of don't see the bigger picture until you point it out. And then they go, oh, okay. Yes, I we, we could go on. I, I do remember I'm um, when I was at a state school, uh, having the local minister coming in, I suppose what he was doing was special religious instruction, but we sort of all ignored it. <laughs> And, and I don't think it did us any harm. Um, but I do think that the, uh, at, at least here in Victoria, access ministries I know underwent uh, a structural change in the 1990s and it became much more evangelical. And they um, more or less uh, tossed out the benign ministers who used to go in and not... Um, be very effective for people who were much more passionate um, and evangelical. And I think that's what really started to raise the ire of parents once that started to become known. So they might sort of shoot themselves in the foot in a way. The more, the more evangelical and missionary oriented they become, the more ordinary parents um, once they get to know what's going on, are likely to be upset about it. I think that's a very good point, Meredith, and, and we certainly see that um, that there's a lot more evangelical um, volunteers rocking up to do RI. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, look, we, we could go on about this, but I do have to wrap this up um, being respectful of people's time on everybody's behalf. Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, 
Jennifer did say to me that if people, we will um, send out a copy of this uh, webinar to everybody, but also there's a summary of her research, which was written up in one of the Monash publications, and we're very happy to send that out. Um, the scholarly article uh, that Jennifer had published uh, on this topic is available, but we can't send it out. If anybody is interested in the scholarly article, um, Jennifer said that she would be happy to receive an email and send a, a private copy of that scholarly article. So if anybody is interested, please maybe write to me. I can put you in touch with Jennifer for that to happen. Um, but just to wrap this up, if anybody is a parent, a grandparent, um, or knows of parents or grandparents who don't know what's going on, please use the information that we've provided tonight to, to let them know this is not benign. This is a form of grooming um, from some, from a perspective. It is certainly, according to Jennifer, indoctrination. And uh, we shouldn't be tolerating, let alone promoting indoctrination. We should be promoting the proper, proper goals of education, which are critical thinking and inquiry and uh, a love of truth, genuinely truth based on evidence. Okay, with that final uh, little bit of summary, thank you, Jennifer, very much. Thank you, everybody, to, for joining us tonight. Please watch out for our next webinar, which we'll, we will let you all know about on our website. They are always on the fourth Wednesday of every month. So thanks, everybody. Nice to see you again, and good night. Bye.